Dr. Erskine is going to talk about other health during the dry period. And Dr. Ronald Erskine is a professor in the College of Veterinary Medicine at Michigan State University. His specialty is dairy production medicine, and his research interests are bovine mastitis, bovine therapeutics, application of new technologies on dairy farms related to animal health. He received his bachelor at the DVM's degree from University of Illinois, and he did his master's and PhD at Pennsylvania State University. I'm very happy to have with us uh, Dr. Uh, Ronald Erskine. Doctor? Good morning. Well, welcome. It's a beautiful day here in Michigan. I hope it is as where you are as well. I think this is an excellent series to deal with the dry period. And I was requested to, as you can see, talk about utter health or mastitis control or milk quality relative to the dry period. And I have to tell you, after all the years I've been on farms uh, and all the time we've spent, oh, uh, dealing, focusing on clinical mastitis and vaccines and cows and, and all the other things that we do, it's been my impression, it's kind of what goes around comes around, that uh, it all begins really at the start of lactation, but really we have to consider the dry period a lot more than what we've had uh, in the past. Well, relative to the past, I think there was a lot of issues uh, that came up with the dry period. Then we, I think we tended to forget it. And now here we are uh, with some of the current uh, discussions. Uh, we're now back to where we began. So when we talk about the, the dry period and relative to it, we want to make sure that uh, we get the cows off to a, a really good start in lactation. And that's what it's all about. Okay, so folks, back online. And uh, you would never thought I would have practiced this. Uh, so... What we're talking about is the perceptions of milk quality, and, and I, I wanted to talk with what seemed to be a very odd start to talk about dry cows, and that's somatic cell counts, because obviously we don't do somatic cell counts for milking cows. And the key here is, and the point I'm going to make, is that anything we talk about, how we handle our dry cow programs relative to utter quality, is we need a way to monitor it. I'm going to drive home this point, the way we monitor success or not with our Utter health during the dry period is going to be some ag cell counts, particularly those before and after cows dried off. Our perceptions of milk quality, when you talk anymore to many dairy producers or consultants, is that for a long time it revolved around clinical infections. But we know, you know, so these are the cows that are drawing our attention because they're being treated discarded milk and just a, you know all the variety of you know issues of worrying about uh, drugs getting in the tank and and the labor involved but we've known for a long long time that if you are motivated from mastitis control by clinical mastitis only you're missing a lot of the infected cows and depending on the farm but for every clinical case you see there are many many more subclinical infections. These are cows that are still losing uh, milk production, are still having probably much greater losses relative to clinical mastitis, but they're out there. And this is, of course, the issue with SMAC cell counts. This is how we find these subclinical infections. So that perception has uh, been around for a while, but we have had a great emphasis on milk quality driven on bulk tank SMAC cell count milk. Now, this is all good. I don't want to uh, be misquoted or misthought to say that we don't want low smack cell counts in our bulk tanks. And this is good for the consumer, good for the processor, good for the producer. Of course, when we look at the milk quality leaving the farm, when we look at bulk tank smack cell counts or herd DHI averages, these are basically driven on, well, just that, it's a herd average. It's a blended average of all the cows in the herd. The case I'm going to make is that if you're monitoring your mastitis, and yes, we will get back to dry cows, but if you're monitoring your mastitis with bulk tank SMAC cell counts or your herd average DHI cell count, you may be missing the full story. Matter of fact, you might be missing a lot of the story. So while there has been a lot of incentives to get low bulk tank SMAC cell counts on farms, and farms have gotten very good at how to, if you look at our national averages or even globally, uh, how some of the cell counts have been driven down, uh, and this is all a good thing. This can be done in ways that do not necessarily equate to having less mastitis in your herd. For instance, 
milking three quarter cows, culling cows, treating cows, drying off cows. All of these things can uh, help maintain a low herd average max cell count, but all the while, we may still be having a mastitis problem. So the thing I want to drive home is that when you look at a bulk tank's max cell count, it's not balanced. It's not a uh, evenly distributed around the herd. No matter what your herd size, whether you're milking less than 200 cows, two to 500 cows, greater than 500 cows, thousands of cows, the take home message is that a very small portion of any herd, no matter the herd size, contributes a really outsourced or uh, exaggerated amount of, a SMA, of the SMAC cells to a bulk tank or the herd average. And in this table, you can see what the three highest SMAC cell count cows in a herd might contribute. In a small herd, those cows are gonna have a much higher impact than in a larger herd. And the larger the herd gets, the less and less impact that the highest cows in the herd will have, at least the two or three top cows. But no matter what herd size you're dealing with, and I've seen this happen over and over and over again, if you look at the highest 2% of cell count cows in a herd, you will have pretty much on average anywhere between 30 to 35% of the, all the SMAC cells are being contributed to that bulk tank just by that small portion of the cows. And this is important because what happens is that many farms end up directing their program targeting this small group of troublemakers, the chronic cows with the high cell count that get culled. These are the cows that are likely to flare up with clinical mastitis. So much of the effort on herds are scrambling after this very small portion of the cows who are contributing a disproportionate amount of the cell counts, but they're missing the, all the other cows that are infected in the herd. And what that means is if we were trying to follow mastitis, and eventually we'll talk about dry cow and fresh cow mastitis in a herd, we have to be very careful to use herd averages as our monitor for whether we're progressing or not in terms of um, our milk quality. Here's just a simple example from a uh, uh, herd from DHI records. Uh, you see that each month there was a herd average SMAC cell count. Uh, we had been working with this herd. Uh, they had relatively high cell counts. We wanted to get them down. But I want to draw your attention to the disconnect between the herd average SMAC cell count, that's the second column on the left, and what is really going on in the proportion of infected cows in the herd. If you look at the red box, you see that uh, I picked two months, the second and third month that we were on this herd. And I remember the producer saying, oh, look at this. We've had a great, we, we, this herd was uh, try looking and changing different things like teat dips. And sometimes we get in discussions on liners or bedding or whatever it may be on many farms. And this producer is on the impression that things were really going well because they had a drop from one month to the next of 50,000 in the SMAC cell count, which is a good thing. But if you look at the next column over, which is the proportion of cows who had a linear SMAC cell count of zero to three or under 140,000, these are cows that generally, at least on DHI testing for SMAC cell counts, will hold as not being infected. They have a high, high probability that they're not infected. And you can see that while that SMAC cell count was going down on the average level, that the proportion of cows who were not infected in terms of subclinical mastitis actually went down. In other words, or the, put it this way, they had more subclinical infected cows. Why? Because in the second month, they had 69% of their cows who were in that non-infected category. The following month, there was 64. And I just want to draw this to your attention in that if you're using herd average cell counts and not tracking the proportion of cows who have a high linear score, that is four or greater, you really can have a disconnect. And it all goes back to that imbalance, that small proportion of those cows with really high cell counts, that they would be way over on the right-hand column, that will have an outsized impact on the herd average max cell count but they're really not telling us the whole story, and that is the proportion of infected cows in the herd. 
And so, as I said, if you look at this herd, they had a decrease of 50,000 in their SMAC cell count, and yet they had a 5% increase in their infected cows. This is why, as we talk about monitoring dry cow mastitis, we don't want to measure or use our bulk tank or herd average cell count. So what are goals? We know from tracking a relatively large field project that we had over the last few years that uh, here are 126 herds from uh, several states, mostly Michigan, but also some from Pennsylvania, Florida, Indiana, Ohio. What do we see? Here you see a three-year trend. It's been going the right way. And what we're taking are from the DHI records, a uh, what, what I call the, um, the, the dry period infections. I'll explain that in a second. That is uh, what's happened from when the cow dried off to when she calved. And the way DHI will calculate this is to say, okay, where was her SMAC cell count or linear score before she dried off the previous lactation? Where is it now on her first test date in her current lactation? If a cow is below a four, linear score of four at dry off, and she's now over a four in her first test date, we would call that a new subclinical mastitis. Now I say dry period. We know that, of course, that the first test date may come a week or two weeks after calving. Can we really dissect whether or not the infections occurred soon after calving or during the dry period? No. But if we consistently use this metric and if we're looking at what do we do in the dry period and as soon after uh, calving as part of our management regimen and how are we doing, this kind of gives you a sense of what some of the better herds are doing. So if you look at the, uh, the white colored bars, those are the averages of these herds that we were tracking. So in 2014, for example, about 16% of the cows uh, would have had a low SMAC cell count at dry off, and now they have a high SMAC cell count after calving. The green bars are what the top 25% of this group of 126 herds were doing. So here's your, here are the herds that are setting the trend. And of course, they are lower than the, the average, but again, whether an average herd, but especially among the trendsetters, you can see this has been declining. In fact, if people ask me now, what's good, what's attainable, um, in terms of uh, what we'll call these new subclinical mastitis cases over the dry period, I say it should be less than 10% of your cows. That is, less than 10% of your cows who dry off with a low SMAC cell count should have a high SMAC cell count of calving. Another way of looking at it is, uh, now this would also include that the last one would just of course be older cows, because we're talking dry period, would be say, okay, let's look at what proportion of cows, uh, if we take a snapshot of your herd, all the cows who calved this past year, what proportion of your cows just had subclinical mastitis on their first test date? So this would include heifers now. And again, the same rules apply of sorts, although this is just a simpler question. I come into your herd, I call up the um, SMAC cell count reports, what proportion of the herd that's currently in your herd now had a high SMAC cell count when they calved. And uh, again, the comparison between the average herd and the top 25% of the herds, you see where the trends are going. And again, I don't think that anybody should have more than 10% of their animals with a um, litter score four or greater, so they're infected when they calve. Now, to drive home, so we talked a little bit about, all right, so this is how at least we're measuring how we're doing over the dry period in terms of subclinical mastitis. Uh, just to drive home the point again of the disconnect between, gee, my herd average is doing this, uh, I think I'm doing fine. Here is a, uh, a graph of a herd. You can see it was, uh, this herd was on a field trial of ours over a course of a couple, three years. Uh, what you're looking at in that black line is that uh, what we call the dry cow new infections. Again, cows with a low smack cell count before drying off, now they're high after calving. And when you look at the line, if you looked at the trend about starting in uh, May of 2015, it actually tracked up for the next year 
That is more cows were calving with subclinical mastitis with new infections. They didn't have a drying off and then kind of tailed back down after we uh, discussed things with the producer, at least about to where the levels were, where they started way back uh, two years before. But the point is that when you looked at what was going on in the dry cows and what was going on in that dry period and how they were managing mastitis in the dry period, at the very best, it wasn't improving. And in fact, it probably got a little worse over from uh, spring of 2015 to spring of 2016. I put those blue arrows just to pick two time points to show you where the herd average SMAC cell count was at those two times. And if we are having this discussion with the producer and they changed whatever it was relative to the dry cow program, and said, well, gee, look at my cell count, my overall cell count's 30,000 lower than it was a year ago. What I'm doing must have really worked. Now, there, of course, there are other things that go into mastitis and just dry cows. What they would be missing is that even though they were pleased that their herd average cell count was lower, their dry cow mastitis program had actually gotten worse. And this can be the disconnect. So the bottom line is, if you were not using individual SMAC cell counts, and it could even be CMTs, before and after calving, I will challenge you to tell me how well or what you're doing in your dry period is really affecting your mastitis. Yes, there are other measurements we'll talk about later, such as clinical mastitis and early, uh, the early lactation, but this is an issue because we know many herds are giving up individual SMAC cell count testing. So, all of that to lay the foundation for how we're going to track change. Because we can now talk about anything. We can answer questions later about all sorts of things we could do with our dry cows. And my first response will be, yes, but have you been able to track whether or not these changes have really been beneficial? And if you don't have a way to monitor change, as we've just discussed, I will be at best skeptical. Having said that, let's talk a little bit about dry cow therapy and some of the uh, discussions have been going on. Uh, for instance, as a dairy producer, should they use, be using blanket or selective dry cow therapy? Uh, we'll talk a little bit about what I call the numbers game, reducing bacteria for dry cows on the teat. And then we're gonna call or talk a little bit about what I call the milk problem uh, and no, I'm not talking about economics. I'm talking about from the physiology of the cow and relative to other health. So a brief history lesson. Uh, I don't want to get into a big discussion about uh, dry cow and the products and all that. But suffice it to say, if you go back now 50 years, uh, Dry cow therapy was first realized to be successful in reducing new intermammary infections or mastitis, subclinical mastitis especially, during the dry period. And uh, there were a whole group of commercial products, many of them that are still in the market, that came on, first started coming on board in the 1970s. There were clinical trials that demonstrated the, um, the benefits of those products. Uh, Here's a Canadian study where, uh, again, in the 70s, but they studied all the licensed Ontario dairy herds, and they found that uh, herds with lower bulk tank SMAC cell counts, the biggest differences that they had relative to herds that had higher cell counts, that they applied post-milking teat dipping, they applied blanket dry cow therapy, and they got regular veterinary care and advice. My personal bias came in um, as I was leaving practice. I started uh, working through extension and some research in uh, Penn State or Pennsylvania State University. And uh, this is a world when we still had a lot of strep agalactia and staph aureus in the herds. Matter of fact, I'm almost embarrassed to say that uh, the legal limit for um, the pasteurized milk ordinance legal limit for bulk tanks max cell counts at this time was still 1 million uh, cells per ml. That's 1 million. However, when we looked at herds who had low SMAC cell counts for 12 months running compared to herds who obviously were on the upper end, uh, problem herds over 700,000, uh, 
to no surprise, the uh, well-managed herds had a much lower prevalence of strep ag and staph aureus. And uh, the two biggest management tools that these herds consistently applied relative to the herds that did not were post-milking tea dipping and blanket dry cow therapy. So you can see where a lot of this foundation of why we have relied on dry cow therapy for so long. But the world has changed and the dairy world along with it. We have uh, larger dairies that are uh, among other things relying more and more on hired labor. We have whole different milking systems and parlor systems uh, that we now have to navigate not just the equipment and milking the cows and dipping the cows, but uh, with these larger dairies, um, how do we get whole groups of uh, dry cows infused and stay on schedule? Um, we now have such uh, products as internal teat sealants that were not available in the 1980s that certainly can play a role in preventing new infections. And uh, the housing has changed. So now we have uh, where the cow is with the bedding and the ventilation and everything else that goes into that exposure of the teeth to bacteria is, is a different world. And remember, uh, this has all changed in a relatively short period of time and continues to change uh, as we go forward. And there's been a shift in pathogens partially because of the housing and everything else. But when I showed you some of the original studies advocating blanket dry cow therapy, uh, they were solid, but it was a world in which we had a lot more or a higher prevalence of strep agalactia and staph aureus. So now we live in a world where uh, coliform organisms are, are more predominant or perhaps environmental strep or strep-like organisms like lactococci. Uh, we have mycoplasmas and that uh, heifer or that cow with the head tilt. Uh, that is, of course, a whole different uh, pathogen that's not very related, at least uh, from a dry cow therapy standpoint. Uh, the mastitis from that pathogen is not going to be controlled for dry cow therapy. So we've had a shift in the, the management. We've had a shift in the um, the overall herd demographics, and we've had a shift in the pathogens. And when you look at a lot of the dry cow therapy products, the antibiotics were really designed to deal with gram-positive cocci, such as uh, the staphylococci and uh, the streptococci. And this may not be relevant in uh, some of the herds today. So there are good reasons for herds to step back and reconsider, should we keep on using blanket dry cow therapy? And I just outlined just to remind you, the herd demographics, lower prevalence of contagious pathogens, advances in milking systems, what I believe overall has been a great improvement in housing, especially when we look at sand bedded free stalls, and uh, the co commercial availability of internal teat sealants. So is blanket dry cow therapy obsolete? And I guess it depends on the herd. If there was a literature review done by a Dufour and others in Canada just, uh, well, it's been almost 10 years ago now. Uh, and basically, they, it was still found that from the review of the literature, the blanket dry cow therapy equals less mastitis. Uh, I will say we had a very similar uh, survey done more recently in 2013 uh, in our Quality Milk Alliance project, which I'll mention later. Again, blanket dry cow therapy was a, uh, associated with lower SMAC cell counts. However, if you look at these studies, and uh, for instance, in this one, the literature review included reports from 1979 forward. Well, that one included a time when we had a lot higher prevalence of contagious mastitis. So maybe it's a little dated. So with increasing uh, interest in the consuming public and also for public health uh, with considering carefully why and how we should use antibox in a dairy farm. Uh, I think very reasonably the, the topic of selective dry cow therapy uh, should be on the table. And I, I'm not going to go through uh, 
all the different studies and um, uh, you know, the pros and cons, but I think it suffices to say that when you look at an option of selective dry cow therapy in a dairy herd, there are some considerations to be made where it might work. If it's done properly, it is uh, very likely could be a benefit to the farm. But here's, here are some of the key points that need to be considered. This is the type of a program where I would say top level herds, that 20, top 25%, think back to the new infection rates we talked about over the dry period. So we're talking about these herds that are already managing dry cow period infections less than 10%. Uh, these are the type of herds because of their getting the protocols done correctly, employee management, whatever it takes, are already doing the right thing and thus would be good candidates to consider for selective dry cow therapy. You absolutely, positively need a good plan to select which cows are going to be treated from those that are not. Again, there's been a lot of vari variation in the literature, but it comes down to this. You need to find that cow who is infected and most likely subclinical infected uh, at dry off. Your best tools are going to be individual SMAC cell count. Now it could be a California mastitis test or CMT, but your best tools are gonna to be SMAC cell count. And again, there have been varying degrees. Should it be just one time, two or three times, a history of low SMAC cell count. Um, culture that has been in, uh, used in some studies. So you not only you pre-select cows from SMAC cell count, and then you culture the quarters to make sure they're not infected, but that can be very labor intensive. And then of course, other useful information such as her clinical history. Uh, cows who had a, uh, a history of having two or three clinical episodes during the previous lactation as you're drying her off, for instance, that might not be a good cow to select to not treat. So this has to be done on a herd by herd basis. But the bottom line is, that if you don't have in place a solid method of finding those subclinical infected cows, or even knowing what proportion your cows are infected at drying off, this is gonna be a real challenge to use selective dry cow therapy. And that's what has been consistent in all the studies. On the flip side, you almost have to have the same kind of thing in place to monitor the outcome. Okay, so you've, you partition cows to selective or in blanket dry cow or treat to not treat at dry off. What are the results? Same rules apply. You need a way to monitor subclinical infection as these cows calve or soon after calving. If you don't, you're going to potentially miss some of the, um, the impact of your decision to either treat or not treat that cow. Clinical history is important, particularly clinical mastitis in the first 30, 45 days is very much associated with whether or not that cow is subclinically infected at calving and hence going back to the dry cow therapy. So good records of clinical mastitis, culture of those clinical cases would be very useful to know what kind of bugs you're seeing. And if there's a link between um, if you, you know, what you might have gotten from culture from before calving. So the same rules apply. You, you need to find these cows to decide if they're gonna be treated to begin with, and then you need it to monitor on the opposite end of the pipe, are they still infected? And then most of the studies that have shown the best results with selective dry cow therapy have also included internal teeth sealants as part of the program. Because dry cow therapy, we have known for a long time not only treats or hopefully cures existing infections. It helps prevent new infections in the early part of the dry period. We'll talk about that in a bit. So uh, to review, if you're going to consider select dry, or select a dry cow therapy, these are, there are herds that should try it and herds are probably are not good candidates. You need a thorough way to select the cows to treat or not to treat. You have to have a way to monitor the outcome and probably use of internal teeth sealants is a good idea.
the benefits, a lot less labor, and as you might suggest uh, or think that a lot less drug use. Uh, so if it's done well, it can, uh, there can be a lot of uh, benefits for a dairy farm. Uh, clinical trials have also shown that uh, herds that have introduced this or cows who are not treated and have been selected well do not, uh, or there aren't any differences between treated cows in terms of uh, long-term outcomes like milk production or clinical mastitis episodes. So again, this selective dry cow therapy can work, but it has to be done well. And I, it sounds like a broken record, but I'm gonna repeat it anyway. Uh, here again, we're using, uh, we're monitoring subclinical mastitis over the dry period. We're going back to that, what we call the, uh, uh, the, the, the dry cow period infections. And the black line are the older cows. The green ones are the, uh, the heifers who are, uh, have mastitis at, uh, at calving. And this herd we uh, worked with, it was the uh, summer of 2015. The producer had decided to invest in a uh, new dry cow barn, but also start using internal teat seals. Now, this is not a clinical trial to try to dissect which were this or that, but I just want to show you that over the next year and a half, as time went on, that rather than having about 14, 15% of their dry cows with a new infection over the dry period as by linear score, that that got down to about 6%. And that's quite a drop. And we'll talk about why that's important later. Interestingly, notice that among the heifers, th that issue stayed pretty much on track where it had been. So is this cause and effect? No. But would I have some degree of confidence that if somebody implied internal teeth sense in the herd or select a dry cow therapy, if I were tracking that black line, so to speak, in that herd, I would have more confidence that A, either things improved or B, at least they didn't get any worse with our decision if we had this information over long term. Oh, and uh, just can't help but point out, during this whole time, while the dry cow therapy, or I'm sorry, the dry cow new infections were having, or better, over the year and a half, the uh, producer's cell count relatively stayed about the same. Matter of fact, it tracked up a little bit, but I will just call it to stay the same. So again, that disconnect, this farm would have never known the benefit that they received from changes in their dry cow program if all they were doing was looking at the bulk tank max cell count as their monitor for mastitis. Okay, let's talk a little bit about the numbers game, bacteria, because that's really what it comes down to. I've often described mastitis as it's a matter of how many bacteria on the teat end and, and can get into the street canal. Uh, dry cow housing is highly variable between herds. And oftentimes, uh, in my opinion, it's an afterthought or, gee, we had this old uh, lactating cow barn. Obviously, they're going to move to the new hotel, so to speak, when the new barn is built. And we'll just put the dry cows in the old free stall that we had. Uh, if we're going to hold true that what happens in the dry period for utter health is critical, we have to consider, if we're talking about teat or bacteria in the teat, that uh, what goes on in the dry period is equally as important. Yes, cows aren't milking. Yes, they're not potentially leaking milk in the stalls, at least maybe after the early dry cow period, but the correlation or the connection between housing, obviously, or obviously housing between dry cows and what goes on uh, for their infection rate is, uh, is very strong. And we're gonna talk a little bit about uh, what's going on the teat of some or the teat ends of these cows later? Uh, so, little things: making sure the stalls are well kept up, well bedded. Uh, picture matter of fact, it was developed at um, University of Wisconsin with uh, Dr. Ruig and her colleagues. Uh, utter hygiene scores. We're very typically we'll walk down a 
feed bunk and do these for lactating cows, why not dry cows? Uh, why not the pre-fresh pen? Because you can see equally as good information about the hygiene of the cow's udders in a dry uh, pen as just as much as in a lactating pen. And yet they oftentimes get overlooked. While we're talking about the TDEN and bacteria, let's talk a little bit about um, infusions and, and be they lactating or dry cow therapy infusions. There is a oftentimes a misconception that if I'm infusing, uh, I'm infusing a cow, and boy golly, if I'm putting an antibiotic up in her quarter, I don't have to much worry because, gee, if I take a few bugs up in there, uh, they'll be uh, cured anyway, and which is wrong. Uh, I have dealt with herd outbreaks of things like Pseudomonas, where poor teat infusion processes uh, ended up uh, with acute Pseudomonas or E. coli in dry cows a day or two after calving. Then they have the worst of, of it all because they're not being milked out. And uh, there have been herds I've known who've had severe uh, mastitis in the first day or two after drying off relative to infusion techniques. Um, here's a picture of an internal teat sealant tub and probably only 10 out of 144 tubes remain in the tub and the packets to clean the teats were never open. And this is a, in my opinion, a very big deal. And it's a situation of training, especially if employees are um, being part of the team to infuse cows. I don't entirely, by the way, blame employees. I, I adhere to the rule that a dairy producer told me that 95% of the time, if the employees aren't doing what uh, the protocol asks, yeah, that's the farm's problem, uh, especially if the cows are being rushed through a parlor. Uh, the other thing is, if you make a job easier, it tends to get done better. Uh, it could be very difficult if I had 10 dry cows in a row to infuse all four quarters and I'm given so much time to do it before the next milk stream comes in the parlor. If I'm given those little post uh, stamp size pledgets to clean the teat in. Uh, so make the job easier. Get big wipes and make the job easier to clean the teats. You will find that the people who do that job will really appreciate if you make the job easier. And this is just one of the little things that can be done. I will say we have a couple training videos, don't last very long, at our website, qualitymilkalliance.com. We'll have another slide this later um, of that website that both in English and Spanish, just how to properly infuse a teat. It's little things like this that play a big role in dry cow infection rates. And, and I think uh, some time in the parlor with the people who are doing it, especially among consultants and veterinarians, is time well spent. And so you do get in other uh, issues. Uh, yes, you use internal teat sealant, but it may not be applied properly. The, the teat wasn't squeezed uh, uh, it's to keep the, uh, the material in the teat. Uh, we don't, some herds don't uh, swab the teats with alcohol again before the second infusion. So part of our, um, part of our program at the Quality Milk Alliance was to set up veterinarians, for instance, in this case, as uh, on-farm science teachers and just hands-on teaching. And you'll be surprised, or not, maybe not surprised, of just how much uh, employees appreciate this training and being explained why it's important. So it is the little things. And when we look at a herd with a higher new infection rate over the dry period that we like, we're thinking about those bacteria in the TN. one of the first things I like to do is like, I'd like to visit you during the, uh, whatever day of the week is dry cow treatment day, I wanna be there and I want to watch what's going on, and then we might have a little coaching session. And then let's talk about the milk problem. Mammary gland involution or drying off um, is, uh, is a pretty extensive process physiologically, uh, immunologically, certainly uh, metabolically for the cow. Uh, from an utter health standpoint, if we can get that cow from a lactating cow to a fully involuted dry cow, she then uh, has a far more hostile immune system relative to um, the milking cow. Uh, just some of the highlights, there are more 
higher proportion or concentration of leukocytes or SMAC cells, if you will, particularly, particularly uh, cells like macrophages, which um, are phagocytic or they kind of engulf and destroy bacteria. There's a higher proportion or a higher concentration of immunoglobin or antibodies. Uh, milk is very normally very low, uh, at least non-mastidic milk in with antibodies, much lower proportion than you would get in serum or other tissues. And antibodies play a big role in helping immune cells do their work. Uh, there are other immune factors like complement that are a lot lower in milk relative to the dry cow gland. Uh, lactoferrin is an iron binding protein that interferes with bacterial growth. That increases in the, in the immune or in the dry cow gland. Uh, we hope to get the physical bar barrier of keratin or that waxy plug in the T canal. We're gonna come back to that. And there's what I call no milk interference Milk is, um, interferes with uh, phagocyte function or white blood cell function. They, they get distracted, uh, engulfing the fat in milk and, and other things in the milk that just interfere with the um, immune function relative to other t tissues like in the lung or the gut. So if we can get this cow to this more hostile immune system, this explains in part, I think, why we have generally, uh, we see on average 80% or better of cows who are infected at dry off, uh, not infected, this is again going back to SMAC cell counts, when they calve. It's, it's a good time to clean up infections in the cow. Now, the whole involution process, depending on the cow and how much she's milking and other factors, if you look at the literature, it can go anywhere from two to 21 days after dry off, just depends on where she is in lactation and uh, production and other factors. So here's the issue. We, uh, we want to dry off this cow. And 40 years ago, when we were drying off a cow, she might have been making 25 or 30 pounds of milk a day. And uh, that was pretty relatively easy to get her into the involution. Now, uh, I get calls or emails. And you, many of you probably had the same frustration in that you can have um, a cow still giving 90 pounds of milk and she's six weeks away from calving, um, what do we do? How do we get her from this very high level of production now down to an involuted gland? And the, the answer is, it's tough. So one of the more interesting studies that came out of uh, Canada, although there were participating herds uh, in the US as well, but looked at 300 cows and five herds, and overall, they found, at least in this study, now it's been about 15 years ago, about 11% of the quarters got infected during a dry period. High degree of association, as you might guess, with cows who had cracked teats at dry off, uh, they were 50% more likely to be infected. There's that compromise at the teat end, always important. What surprised me is that, um, well, a couple of things. One, that of course, if the cow could not form that keratin plug early in that first few days, she was more likely to get infected. Well, that didn't surprise me. What did surprise me that they found that almost a fourth of the teats were still open, no keratin plug, even six weeks into the dry period. And that's <laughs> problematic because if we can't, and this is, of course created the window of opportunity for internal teat sealants, because if we can't get cows to uh, shut off the world and we're not milking her, she's gonna get infected. Also, uh, and now there's been other studies to confirm this, but the bottom line is cows who had more milk at dry off, we, we talked about that heavy producing cow at dry off, were nearly two times more likely to have that, to be infected with a new infection over the dry period. So in other words, the more milk that that cow is making at dry off, the more likely she's gonna be infected. And I would, Venture a guess, as this study was done 15, 16 years ago, that the impact and the level of milk production we're getting in our cows as they end into the 305, or they've been milking for 12 months uh, day lactation, the amount of milk they're giving now is even higher than when these uh, researchers found that connection uh, a few years ago. So, we often think of hyperkeratosis or rough teat ends uh, as associated with clinical mastitis. To some extent, that's true in the milking cow. But one thing I want to point out to you, and, and 
to drive home is that you should also be assessing what is the T condition, condition at dry off as we're deciding whether or not to dry off that cow. Because if you see teats like this, you can about bet that you are asking that cow to get a new infection in the dry period. So how are we gonna to try to manage this? And this is where it's going to get to be uh, a little bit of science, a little bit of hypothesis. Uh, of course, when we look at persistency, just to kind of drive home where we're at, historically, we had this area like, by the time the cow got in the last month or so before dry off, she was really decreasing in milk production. We could get her into that involution fairly quickly. We don't have the same cow. Uh, she's giving a lot more milk when we're trying to dry her off. And this hence is leads some of the problem. So where some of the research has gone and, and where it should probably go in the near future is how can we ramp down that cow? In other words, take her down off that, this is showing by month, but probably we're talking like the last couple of weeks or few days. How do we get that cow from that high performing animal? How can we start ramping down her milk production so that we can get her to involute quicker? So here are some thoughts and, and kind of current thinking anyway. Uh, personally, I think currently your best option until maybe others come along uh, is simply to milk her out less frequently. Um, I think some of the robotic milkers are finding this out. You don't get much benefit. I think the research shows you don't get much benefit from going 3x to 2x. Now, I've been an advocate to milk late lactation cows 2x anyway, especially for these herds that are trying to get all their cows through their parlor in 3x and can hardly stay in their schedule and can't do good milk prep because they're in such a rush. I often ask the question, why not just start milking your late lactation cows 2x? They're not going to lose much milk production anyhow. So when you look at the research to really help speed up involution, the best gains are when you actually take that cow down to once a day. Now the question is, how long can you do that? Uh, again, this is a little uh, up in the air, but I think you're stretching it if you're going more than seven days from a risk of infection, but somewhere in that window, uh, of three to seven days seems to be to help get cows to where they want to go. The question is for many dairy farms is that how is that going to work? Now, if you can identify and mark these cows, you send them to the parlor and hey, we just skip her in the morning milking and send her through. Uh, if you have a separate dry cow prep group, this might flash into a little bit when we talk about dietary approaches, but um, this will take a little bit of individual approach on the herd, how to get this done. But I do believe if you can get some of these cows milking less frequently, first 3X to 2X would probably be a good step for a late lactation group. And then take that group down to a 1X or at least those cows you wanna dry off a week before. Um, and, then, <clears throat> and then try to do that for a week. It will be tricky, of course, on many farms due to space considerations to have a separate group. So now it's going to get back to labor training. Dietarily, I used to say, well, just uh, feed cows hay for a few days. That sounds good to me. Uh, that sure crashes them. But now there have been uh, both anecdotally and I think credible research to suggest that if you just crash and burn cows and energy and protein, you sure do decrease their milk. But there have been reports of hypocalcemia, that is milk fever at a cow, as you're trying to dry her off due to the imbalance. Uh, you may create NEFAs. Uh, those are fatty acids in the blood that are risk factor, not only for immune function, but metabolic problems. Uh, I think the best approach uh, to this right now on the research side anyway, the jury is still out, uh, but maybe some of the nutritionists uh, have an approach to how they want to do this. Uh, but it's I don't think it's as easy just to say, well, just crash and burn her on energy or protein. Um, so this can be part of the program, but should be done judiciously and very carefully monitoring the health of the cows uh, as you decrease their, uh, their, or their dietary input. And finally, uh, 
this will be more in the future research, and that is what I'll call metabolic mediators. Um, one way is to find a way to decrease prolactin. That is a hormone that uh, helps support milk production. Uh, one way, that's one of the more intriguing ways I've seen in the research is, to is a shorter photo period or daylight, if you like. So if, especially in the um, uh, in areas that have shorter days, especially in the winter, if you, at least in your dry cow housing, aren't keeping them in uh, uh, bright lights, like you might in there, I know some herds do this to help increase milk production uh, for the lactating cows. Uh, if you have a late lactation group or in a place where you don't, you can kind of cut down on their, their light exposure, uh, that may benefit uh, getting these cows ramping down quicker. There has been a product called Cabergoline, which is a dopamine agonist that it supports dopamine receptors. Uh, it has been, it, it was available commercially both in the EU and South American markets. It does seem to enhance involution, but it was removed from the EU market because of what we mentioned earlier, some uh, problems with hypocalcemia, increasing, um, um, uh, the increasing problems with the uh, cows as they dried off. Uh, the jury is still out, I think, for uh, a real trend on exactly how this impacts utter health, that is infection rates, but at, at least it does seem to speed up involution. Uh, we do believe it's speeding up involution in general tends to be a good thing from an early, uh, at least from a mass diet standpoint. So I would suggest to you that if you're want to track how we can dry off this 100 pound cow, uh, you know, as we're, we're getting in towards homing in on our next calving date, probably the, one of the better articles, uh, it was a review article just came out last year by Zhao and others. Um, for those of you who are interested, I would track this down. You can make your own uh, assessment, uh, pretty exhaustive study of all the different research, but uh, uh, again, uh, further reading I highly recommend. Uh, the folks in Ontario, the Ontario Veterinary College and the Dairy Industry put out a uh, Dairy Industry Working Group fact sheet. Now there are many, and there's your link there, there are many um, articles relative to, uh, their goal was to lower smack cell counts below 200,000, thus the name of the link. But uh, if you go to this page, there's a link for an article about uh, some do's and don'ts, or at least some guidelines, some of what we've talked about of a fact sheet for how to um, try to get a cow to involute or what to do with that high producing cow. So why should you care? We talked about all the, um, I think we already kind of covered this, you know, we, we look at new infections and number one, uh, we always talk about the dry period, or I'm sorry, calving but many people overlook that many new infections started during the dry period as well. We've used dry cow therapy for a long time to lower, lower that bubble of new infections in the dry period. But here, the last couple of three slides just to talk about the impact. Why should you put all this effort into monitoring dry cow infections? Why should you put all the effort into considering it? Because here's a study that was done with 165,000 cows. The upshot of it is that cows who calve with a high smack cell count of test state one compared to the hermates that don't on average lose over or very close to 1600 pounds of milk are more likely to have clinical mastitis and even have increased days open. So it costs money and that was a pretty big study to show it. The longer a cow's infected, the more milk she loses. Here's DHI data from California, Wisconsin, and uh, DRMS, or uh, you know, the PC DART. No surprise, the longer that cow carries a subclinical mastitis, so think of those cows who are calved right at calving in the first test state, the more money they lose. And if uh, they are, on their first month they're infected, no matter when they get infected with lactation, they start losing $1.20 a day. That's not pounds, $1.20 a day, $1.20. If she stays infected for a whole lactation, let's get back to that day one uh, again. She, by the time she's finishing her 305 days, she has lost $2 a day. Think of your profit margin on a cow because she was infected right from the get-go of calving. Clinical mastitis, as I mentioned earlier, 
not only is it more likely to occur for a cow who's subclinical infected dry off, but you get a cow with clinical mastitis in the first 30 days, it costs a lot more money than later on. Usually clinical mastitis averages $150 per case. Cows first 30 days, over $400. Here is our, and we have some articles about use of the SMAC cell counts, other articles where I mentioned the videos. Quality Milk Alliance, big USDA funded project. I invite you to go to the website for more information and follow up.